So hello and welcome to this next incarnation of the first incarnation of the Weird Mass Podcast. And if you understood that, you're already ahead of the game here. Um, I am Matt Wall and on um, YouTube I'm Paperback Junkie. And I'm here with Jason White, who is also on YouTube with Jason's Weird Reads. Hello. How's it going? It is going really good. That intro took a little longer than I thought it would. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for inviting me uh, uh, to join you on, on, on your show here. Oh, no. This is awesome. Like, um, I spent like maybe two or three messages back and forth on videos with you and i was like oh my gosh this guy i could pick his brain this is <laughs> this is worth picking here so um you decided um on a story for us to go over today and um why don't you tell us what that'll be well i i read this story um for the first time and i read this author for the first time uh about two maybe three years ago and this story <laughs> this story really uh it 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 sticks because it's very claustrophobic and it's the graveyard rats by henry kuttner i uh this this story really sticks in my mind because um because of how claustrophobic it is i'm not claustrophobic but this story makes me claustrophobic if that makes any sense Yes, and I am a bit claustrophobic, so this story makes me more claustrophobic. So um, that works out beautifully there. Um, before we get into that, um, I threw a question out to you um, before we started this, where um, we're both writers we're both on YouTube. We both talk about books. Do you think that if writers from way back when had access to YouTube, A, would they have used it, and B, how would that have affected their writing? That's a, you know, that's a good question. And I've been thinking about it since you answered me. And, and yes, I do think they would have uh, utilized uh, things like YouTube because uh, especially guys like Lovecraft, he, he, everyone thinks that he was reclusive and didn't like talking to people, but that is the complete opposite of the way he is. He, he actually wrote to a lot of other writers and, uh, and it, it, I don't, I don't remember the exact word count, but his word count for all the letters that they know of that he did, uh, that he wrote with these people when he was co corresponding with them. It is phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. It, it dwarfed any kind of other writing he did. Yes. Yeah. So I, I know that he would have wanted to reach out to people and I think YouTube would have been a perfect, uh, a perfect medium for him. Um, although, you know, uh, the, the letter writing thing, I, I, I would say probably took over a lot of his fiction writing. So I, th I think that the, the book tubing thing probably would have hijacked a lot of his, uh, <laughs> his writing as well. I totally agree. Like, I don't know if, if he was able to have a soapbox to stand on to talk about all of his ideas about, um, the cosmos and people being, um, nothing but insignificant nothings like if he would have ever even picked up a pen like um if he could have just hit live stream and just sit there and talk because i honestly think he enjoyed listening to himself whether it be through paper or just talking i think he enjoyed that way more than talking to other people yeah I mean, because the letters he wrote were very long. Um, they'd be pages and pages, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm certain that he would, like you said, he'd probably just hit the live stream or he'd make these long, uh, very detailed 
videos with pictures and everything, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. And then I was, like, thinking of, like, Poe and, like, with the way... Um, because, like, we're spoiled. We could just upload a book on Amazon when we want to put a book out. Um, I'm going to actually be doing that when we're done here. So, like, we're very spoiled. But, like, I'm thinking, like, would Poe have even tried to, like, write for newspapers? Or, um, like, would Lovecraft even, like, send stories out to his friends to see what they thought about him before he sent them out? Or would any of these people even have cared about the way the medium was back then if they had access to what we have now? I, I mean, I think it, I almost answered my own question there, but it just boggles my mind. Yeah. Well, you know, the internet really changed everything. Yeah. Uh, it changed the the way we do things now. Like, uh, I, I still remember submitting short stories and, uh, uh, you know, through the mail, through snail mail. <laughs> <laughs> and putting an envelope inside for them to uh, to, to to reply to you. An S A S E. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and that that's unheard of today. You just don't. Today it's all email, right? And uh, and you socialize other ways too, like like with BookTube, which I remember actually when I started watching BookTube, you were you were one of the first channels, and uh, and you you would always start off your videos with uh, hey booktube and I, I i remember thinking what what the hell is booktube <laughs> that's so rad yeah um it took me a little bit um because it seems like whenever anyone gets in on that and for those of you who don't know booktube is youtube for people who talk about books like it's not a different place it's not a different thing um but I, I did the same thing. I can't remember who I saw first. It was a real off-the-wall um, channel. I think it was like Peter Likes Books or something like that. Like a completely... Um, I don't even know how I stumbled on it, but I found it and he started saying BookTube and I'm like, what the hell? And then like I kept just going down that rabbit hole and booktube this booktube that booktube newbie tag and all this yeah. stuff and i'm like oh i have books like i could do that <laughs> yeah that's pretty much how i started too yeah it's so um, weird so i i'm more than certain honestly that um had this technology been available back in those days people like lovecraft or poe um um, the guy we're discussing today, Harry Kuttner, uh, he, I, I'm certain a lot of them would have, uh, jumped on this and, uh, and, and, you know, I, I think we're kind of like, uh, uh, this new generation of, uh, of what they were doing, honestly. Yeah. No, for real. Like that's kind of the whole idea behind weird mask is like taking that, um, aesthetic and that mindset and putting it towards like people of today as well with people of the past but um i just when you were saying that though i was thinking and i'm like i wonder if like sci-fi writers would latch on to the technology like crazy but like your gothic horror writers would be like oh no that's um, dreadful don't don't get sucked into the machine and blah 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 you know what I'm saying I wonder if it would be like um, a genre thing where certain genres like totally like I mean I guess you could kind of look at it now like what's the I mean before paperbacks from hell came out horror tube wasn't a thing I don't think you know what I'm saying yeah Maybe, maybe for movies, but, uh, yeah, but in the tube territory, um, back when I started, it's only like almost three years ago, you know, um, there were only like a few other, uh, 
horror booktubers and i don't think they really called themselves horror booktubers they were just booktubers who talked about horror i think horror booktube didn't really become a thing until recently honestly um we just started calling it because we're we're booktube but we talk about horror and so might as well make it horror book tube, right? Yeah. It's so funny. Like if you put a tube on the end of anything, it's a thing. So, uh, <laughs> it works out. Okay. So enough of that ridiculous train of thought here. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> but, uh, do you want to kind of do a full review of the story? Yeah, sure. Um, so, The Graveyard Rats by Henry Kuttner. This story, um, it has a lot of the things I like. It, it kind of reminds me of uh, older Lovecraft, uh, like when he was younger. And you can definitely tell that this is like uh, one of Henry Kuttner's, uh, you know, his Lovecraft story. Um, I was reading up about the story and they, they refer to, I think, In the Vaults by Lovecraft. This is like his version of that. Um pretty sure that's the name of the story they were comparing it to and honestly i've read that story but i can't remember (laughs) a thing about it but but this story um this story involves uh, a character named old mason i believe uh mason now he's like a he's a caretaker of uh of a graveyard and uh he's not exactly the uh the most honest of uh (laughs) <laughs> caretakers because if he notices anything worth value within the bodies that are being buried during the funeral or whatever he he definitely wants to grab that before before the burial is complete yeah that's getting jacked yeah <laughs> so, there, there, i i have like this weird thing where i really enjoy reading stories about grave robbers and i don't know why that is because i i, I personally would not do any of that but uh but there's just something fascinating about people who are willing to basically take from the dead. It's that, kind uh, of romantic in like a really like macabre kind of way because it's like you have to go out at night. Um, you have to do a tour. No one will see you do it. But then yeah. at the same time, you're freaking out the whole time that you're going to dig somebody up who is going to not be still you know there's there's that whole um yeah that whole gothic uh fear you're right right like you can't really i mean i guess maybe you could do something like that today and probably it does happen but back then there was less less light at night you know so you you had much more of a chance of getting away with it i suppose and uh and so that I don't know. I just find that concept alone fascinating. He he has like a really good deal on this too because he's the caretaker, so he can just he can just pop the lid right before they you know throw in the sand. <laughs> yeah. Take what he wants, but there's something else going on here that that's pretty interesting. Is 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 the war he's having with the rats? That tunnel beneath the earth. He hates rats. And for good reason, I guess, because they uh, they cause a lot of issues. But it's not just that. There's something wrong, you know. There's something wrong with these rats because they're huge. And and it mentions early on in the story, like sometimes the uh, the bodies actually disappear. And uh, and you're just like, you know what? Yeah. And so so, uh, so our, our our hero here, Mason, he uh, he's a uh, during a recent uh, burial, um, uh, the person in the coffin has some, I think it's cufflinks, golden cufflinks that he wants. And he's got his eye on that. And so so he goes and does his thing. And uh, he pops the lid of the coffin. It's in the ground. It's. I think they're going to like throw the sand in the next day. and But he's going to uh, take the cufflinks that night. And uh, it's raining. It's kind of kind of a dumb time to do it, but I guess it's the only time he can do it. Actually, before I move on here, I, I was inter- I found it interesting that he'll even go after people's gold teeth. <laughs> yeah. No, I remember that being like a big thing um, a long time ago. Like I'm like, sure, I'm sure, yeah. But like just to do that, that like 
I don't know. I, I, I guess we live in different times. It just seems rather... That, that's macabre to me because you have to open up the mouth. And, you know, the person has been dead for a few days. I don't even know if they're using embalming fluid. Like, it, it's gross, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, uh, <laughs> I would not want to be responsible for that, either for greed or for other reasons. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, at least this time, it, it, that's not the case. He's, he's after, uh, he's after some, uh, cuff, uh, some golden cufflinks or whatever. And so, yeah, anyways, he pops open, <laughs> he pops open the lid to the coffin and the body's gone. And, but there's a, there's a hole at the end of the coffin and there's a foot. The, the, the body's foot is being dragged, like he can see the foot being dragged through the hole that's there. That right there alone, that, that's pretty creepy stuff. I mean, even for today. Well, it's funny because like when he's standing on the coffin, he could hear something um beneath his feet rustling around and for a second he gets scared and then he's like oh it's just the damn rats you know like there's that moment where he's like oh oh good god what what oh and then he opens it up and sees the the shoe running away from him kind of thing yeah (laughs) and so like any good thief what does he do he uh he goes after it unbelievable this is definitely one of those things where you're constantly like yeah you shouldn't be doing that dude like yeah you could turn around now like don't be doing that <laughs> yeah but no he goes crawling in after it and uh so things progress pretty quickly at this point i mean the, sh- the story itself is only like uh, I don't know how many pages because I read it on my uh, e-reader. It's it's got to be about sixteen pages or something like that. It go it goes from like zero to sixty in like a paragraph, and you're just going that fast the whole time. Yeah. So once he enters that tunnel, that the rats, you know, he, uh, put this in into perspective here. He can crawl into the hole that the rats created. <laughs> and he's talking about the size of these rats, right? <laughs> yeah, and like living out in the desert, um, we have wood rats all over the place. And they live um, under the creosote bushes and stuff like that. And they have burrows. And the biggest one I've ever seen is like big enough that I could maybe put my hand in. And so, and the wood rats are not small. They're like, I was shocked when I actually saw how big they were. But um, I can't imagine how big these things would have to be to make burrows big enough for him to be able to crawl through. Even if he's like the thinnest, tiniest dude, that's yeah. still giant. So he's he's dealing with some some giant rats <laughs> but the thing i like about this story is once he enters that tunnel thing he starts crawling along he's going after that body because he really wants that gold right that i that would have been a, a sign for me though seeing that foot being dragged into the hole i'm like yeah game over let's close this thing up right but yeah no, that, that would be he's, it, that'd be it. <laughs> yeah he, he's going after it and uh but i uh, think the but, thing but, that like just said, like the thing that um, is just burned in my mind, like the image I see, is like if I'm looking through our hero's point of view and I'm in that burrow, in that little tunnel, and I have my light up and I can see the soles of the corpse's feet and I keep getting closer and then they keep pulling away a little bit and then I keep getting closer and then they keep pulling away a little bit that image has been just like etched in my mind yeah um there's one thing i i i picked up about this story as well um is that there's oh i wish i I should have wrote it down but there's a mention of some other force involved that i think was just a rumor and so it's something is happening to these rats they're not just big because they're giant rats there's there's something else going on and uh, and that's I guess causing 
the size. He mentioned a like an, an an ancient god type thing that you would you would expect from a Lovecraft story, if I remember correctly. Um, I don't know if I should do it here. Yeah, I'll just do it here. Well, I was looking through this and I'm like graveyard rats. This sounds really familiar. Um, when you brought it up, and so I started looking through stuff, and I could, I'm like, no, I don't have any cut or anything like anything like this. And um, I'm a big Robert E. Howard fan, and then I found there's a story called The Graveyard Rats, written by Robert E. Howard, that was published the same year as this, which was totally bizarre. So they're both 1936. Um, and his story is quite different than this. His is like a, um, almost like a weird menace Scooby-Doo story that kind of takes place out in the West, um, probably present day um, in a frontier town, but present day to 1936 um, kind of feel. And... What they were talking about is that um, graveyard rats is a real thing, according to this story, and that um, they eat the flesh of the dead, and if the people who they're eating were bad people, their spirit and their memories live and grow inside these rats and make them bigger and they said that it was a native american um not tradition what's the word i'm looking for superstition or something like that so i don't know if this was like a commonly known thing um i i want to dig a little bit more into uh just the history of this thing being real um, and seeing like what I could come up with. So if I come up with anything, I'll let you know. But um, this story is way cool. better than the Robert E. Howard story. The Robert E. Howard story is probably twice as long with 80,000 characters that don't need to be in it. And um, you have a Scooby Doo ending. So um, super fun. It was good. Yeah. It just wasn't this. This, yeah. this. This is a roller coaster of hell, and yeah. that was not. So, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, that's fine. Um, but the one thing I really like about this story is how it quickly it escalates once he's in that tunnel. Because like you said, he's, he's, he's following that body, and he's trying to grab it, but it keeps slipping from his hand. And then, you know, he starts getting attacked. Um, <laughs> by these rats, they're like biting into his legs, and and you know that this is like probably a good halfway through the story, um, but this is where you start to really feel the uh, um, you feel closed in, and and yeah. you can feel that you're in that that earth with the the you know the the earth is surrounding you, it's crushing you almost, and uh, so he decides at some point wisely <laughs> that he should turn around oh uh because he's in a tunnel he finds other tunnels and uh and he uses one of those tunnels to turn around and he heads back and he's he's on his way back but well i don't know if we if you know if anyone wants to read this story if we should spoil it or i mean i think if you like definitely if you haven't read this stop right now read it it'll take you like 10 minutes and yeah. come right back like um this is gold I, I don't think we could talk about this without talking about how it ends yeah for sure because because uh well obviously <laughs> he uh he doesn't make it <laughs> That's, that's the nicest way to put it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't go well for, for poor old Mason here. You, you know, you could uh, you could argue, I guess, maybe, like, this is this story kind of reminds me of, uh, 
uh, those old, uh, you know, anthology films, um, where the bad guy gets his, uh, he sort of gets what he deserves, right? Like those old, like, Abacus movies? Yes, exactly. Like yeah, Asylum yeah, yeah. or, uh, uh, In the Vault, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. Gatekeeper. Oh, man, my, my brain is, like, flatlining on me today. But, uh... <laughs> But yeah, um, actually, I, I have like part of the last, actually the last uh, paragraph highlighted here. Do you mind if I read it? No, go ahead. Do it. White hot agony lanced through his breast, throbbed in his eyeballs. His head seemed to be swelling, growing larger and larger. And suddenly he heard exultant squealing of the rats. He began to scream insanely, but could not drown them out. For a moment, he thrashed about hysterically within his narrow prison, and then he was quiet, gasping for air. His eyelids closed, his blackened tongue protruded, and he sank down into the blackness of death with the mad squealing of the rats dining in his ear. <laughs> Dude, so he's dying while well, all he can hear are the, are the rats, like, chewing on him. <laughs> It's like the when it talks about his blackened tongue, yeah. <laughs> that I'm like, okay, like, see, there's a couple things about this. First off, like, there's one point where he's crawling down, trying to find his way out while he's being attacked by these rats, that he sees this like mummified almost corpse crawling towards them. Yes. You know what? And they get face yeah. to face you know and what? it's alive. I don't know how I forgot that, but yes. And it's just like okay, first off, what the hell is that? Second, why is this just in here? And then like that's it. Like that was like it's almost like one of those things where it's like you think, oh, this is where the story's going. The rats were just uh, almost like a red herring to get us to this other thing in the story. Yeah. And it's like, no, he turned left, and now he's not going to deal with that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> but so that was just like too much. I was like, like, I that was amazing but i almost think you didn't need to have that in there no you didn't but you know what it adds so much because oh, i think it does it, it it points to something much bigger happening behind the scenes things we don't know about things we can't know about because mason doesn't know about it so it would make sense to not go into that right but it's yeah. there regardless and it makes you wonder like okay what the hell is that <laughs> you know what i mean yeah and it's like when you're reading this i don't know if it's because of how claustrophobic it is but even when you were reading that last bit back i kept noticing that i wasn't breathing yeah i was like holding my breath and it's like i don't know if it's like because of the restricted space that he's in during this whole thing but the part that like gets me and the funniest thing about this is this guy is a total piece of crap <laughs> yeah. he's not even like a good guy and we're hoping against hope that he's gonna make it out of this right yeah and as soon as like he there's this rock and he pulls this rock down um hoping that it'll it'll block the way of the rats and he'll be able to get out and so he pulls the rock down and then he like kind of dives as the tunnel's collapsing into um, satin. So he's like inside the coffin. Yeah. And he's like, oh, yeah. thank God. And then he like starts to get up and he can't move because there's a top on the coffin. And so he's, but you think he's in the coffin that this whole story started at, but he's not. He's in some other grave somewhere else in the graveyard that's still buried. Yeah. And it's yeah. like... Oh, just like the way your hope goes out and then just gets crushed. Yeah. Like yeah. this story hits everything so perfectly, so quickly. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's just um, like I and I can't believe this was his first story he got published. This is just nuts. This is like from beginning to end just solid. Oh, it is. Um, 
he's got good characterization going because we get an idea from pretty early on that um, uh, Mason, the guy we're following, is, well, he's scum. Um, <laughs> and uh, he his ability to create that claustrophobia as the tunnels are collapsing on him <laughs> and the earth is like shaking and there's something coming as he's trying to get out he knows something's coming and he's trying to hurry but he can't because the earth is getting tighter around him and then like you said he gets stuck in that coffin that empty coffin it's so great too because there's parts where he's like yeah and then i saw something past that that was even bigger but i couldn't make out what it was yeah. <laughs> you know and so it's like He's going to show you a bunch of horrific things, but then he's going to just allude to other horrific things to make it that much worse. Yes. And as far as, like, the action goes, like, suspenseful action, he's he has a gun, and so he's, like, shooting these rats inside this little tunnel. And at one point, they're coming up his legs, and so he's like, I pointed the gun down there and had to... Um, push my feet against the wet walls just to make sure I wouldn't blow my foot off or something like that. Yeah. Just like little bits like that instead of it just going, I fired, I fired, I fired. Yeah. Like yeah. just little touches made this so good. Yeah, he hands he handles all the terror and all the details like a master. Um maybe maybe he'd been writing a lot. Uh, up to this story I don't know but uh, because you know a lot of writers uh, they find their voice through you know a lot of failure so I'm assuming that this isn't his first story written yeah but Henry Kuttner he went on to write a lot um, but he he also used a lot like if you look up his name and and you can find collections online that you can read of his but he wrote under a lot of pseudonyms. Um, and I also read that his wife um, his wife and his friends kind of chided him for that. They're like, why don't you ever just publish everything under your own name? Because, you know, uh, why not take the glory for yourself? But he continued doing the pseudonym thing. But, uh, <laughs> but he, I guess he started off writing under his, uh, his real name. I don't know. But he uh he's very like obviously just from this story the the sense of dread and uh, the atmosphere um the terror that he invokes within you as as this character's crawling <laughs> crawling through these tunnels yeah it's it's very well done um i actually am very excited to try to find a story of his that is a, about a very wide open space and see if he can <laughs> do the um, same make that same kind of like dread you know well this one um i've only read a handful of uh of stories by this by henry cutner and i have to say uh this one stands out um the other stories of his that i have read i honestly don't remember so he really hit the the nail on the head with this one but that, that that doesn't take away from those other stories um i generally forget what i read but uh um yeah this story though it, it has a lot going in it's almost like he 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 knows what he's talking about when he's crawling through tunnels of earth yeah. you know underground it's like maybe he's done it i don't know but but yeah like he oh. He really did uh, an excellent, phenomenal job, and, th and that this is the reason why I, I chose this story because it really, it really sticks out. You you remember this story, don't yeah. And it's so crazy too because he had so many. Um, I don't I don't want to say a number because I don't know offhand, but he had numerous covers on like Weird Tales and Lovecraft, like never had a cover in his lifetime you know what i'm saying and that just is so boggling because a lot of people probably had never heard of this guy we are talking about today yeah probably but yeah. everyone in their mom knows who lovecraft is through something or another yeah you know what i'm saying um it's just 
like he obviously had the talent but I wonder if the pseudonym game really slowed him down that would be very interesting honestly I would say that it probably did because uh, nobody knows who you are if you keep changing your name right uh, in the writing game um, and you don't really stick to anything in, until you see its its success. I mean, when I say this guy had a lot of pseudonyms, I'm not talking about just one, or, like three or four. He had like a huge list. <laughs> yeah, and, it, it, and those it, are it, just known. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's like that's a good be, point because there could be tons more. Yeah, when I looked into this, it, it did say these are the known ones, but there's probably more, and and it's like wow, like. Uh, this first of all, he wrote a lot, and I, I believe he he well, he was very prolific, and I believe he he ended up being mostly a science fiction writer. And uh, but uh, you know, if it, I I think he could end up becoming in the future, being remembered a little bit more than he is now, honestly. If if yeah, because there are collections of his. They uh, I think they're mostly science fiction though. <laughs> But uh, there's some, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, Amazon um, Kindle collections. Of I think collections. there's a collection, if I'm not mistaken, there's a collection of his um, Cthulhu Mythos type stories. Um, but I can't tell you who put that out. Uh, what is it called? I'm sure it's not hard to find if you just search Kuttner and Mythos. Like, I'm sure something will pop up, but I do think there is something like that. Yeah. Um, do you read uh, ebooks at all? Yeah. I, um, like, I made a joke the other day. Like, I might be the paperback junkie, but I'm the ebook whore. So, so um, that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, like right now in the situation we are living in, all of, not all, like, we've accumulated some, but probably like 98% of our books are in storage. So, um, the majority of stuff that I do read is ebooks at the minute. Yeah, I I read because of my uh, uh, my work schedule. It's pretty weird. Um, because I'm at work a lot, um, you can't have like books around, so it's so much easier just to read off an e-reader or your your yeah. cell phone. Um, so I, I've come to actually prefer e-readers, but. Uh, like reading off the Kindle app or whatever. Um, but I know that, uh, there's this one, I don't know who runs it, but there's, uh, the mega pack. Have you heard of those? Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, they're really they, cheap and they yeah. do a lot of like, not just a ton of those. Yeah. Not just with like horror or the Cthulhu mytho mythos. Um, they, they do like old Westerns, um, science fiction, fantasy, anything you can think of that was part of the, uh, uh, the, the the pulps I guess from yeah. uh, like as far back as you can go and they they republish these and like I said each book will have like a lot of stories in them and even like novellas and some novels and it's all like 99 cents and it's all very well done it's not it's not cheap but by any standard do you right? find a lot of errors in the text in those not really uh with some like sometimes um with other uh, productions, I guess you could call them, or, or people who put out books by just say H.P. Lovecraft. Um, actually, I don't think there are any who do that with H.P. Lovecraft's work, but I'm just using him as an example um, where you'll find tons because you could tell that they either just typed it out of like the text themselves or it just they scanned it or something. I don't know what. But, yeah, I can't remember what the name of the software is, but there's something that you can, um, like, uh, you scan the document. So if you had, like, a paperback book, you'd rip the pages out of a paperback book, slide them through this machine, and it makes it a, um, 
movable, edible, edible, editable document. And um, a lot of times, like, instead of an L, it'll put a 1. Or if there was, like, a smudge on something, it will try to figure out what the smudge was supposed to be. So, like, all of a sudden you'll get some word that's not a word, like, in the middle of a sentence. And you're like, what the hell is that? <laughs> and if you were looking at it on the original paper, you could kind of see, oh, I guess something got folded there or something when this was being printed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Or there was, like, a, a knot in the wood on the paper or something like that. Like in an old paperback. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when they do that, um, a lot of times it um, just doesn't do it correctly. And a lot of times the people who put these books out because they want to put them out so quickly, they don't um, check all of this stuff. And so you get a lot of books that have um, things like that. And I don't think I've had any problems like that with the mega packs that I've read. But. Um, with a lot of collections, um, I find those a lot. Yeah, definitely. Tons, yeah, definitely. I find those. I do. I do come across what you're talking about, and sometimes it's just like it's almost unreadable in some cases, and uh, so you got to be careful. But I would trust the mega packs because, like I said, they're they're fairly cleaned up. Um, I ha I mean, you run into issues uh, with like typos or or something like you know weird symbols and stuff but uh for the most part it's it's mostly yeah. it's mostly like really really well done and cheap too like that's the one reason why i like going back to the mega packs because uh they produce pretty good ebooks uh i mean there there's stuff in there and they're that about you've never back, right? ever yeah. heard of yeah and uh and it's fairly cheap, and it's you get the same thing from uh, the bigger publishers who who put out something similar. Yeah, I actually um, the last mega pack I got was a Kothar mega pack, um, Gardner F Fox, and that's fine. I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm down with the mega packs. Awesome. All right. So, um, All right. yeah, I guess that's it. Um, if you, if you listening, if you have any questions or comments, um, you could send them to weird mass zine at, uh, gmail.com. I'll put that in the notes and where can people find you and your stuff? Um, you can, f uh, the best place to find me is either on Twitter and, uh, you can find me there, Jason underscore White, seventy four, and on my YouTube channel, I'm there the most, I would say, and uh, that's Jason's Weird Reads. I am on Facebook too, but I don't really use Facebook. Yeah, I try not to. Um, I only have it because there's certain things that I have to have it for, but um, I would rather not ever go on there. Um, but yeah, you could, um, find me at I hate Matt or, uh, weird And, um, I guess that'll be it for now and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye everybody. All right. Bye.